Jesus, right on, right on, the conquering king, right on, right on, King Jesus. What a king we have in Jesus. Wow. But before I begin, let Benny sing for me a song, Benny Safari. Why should I be discouraged? Isn't it good to believe in God? Are you sure it is? Isn't it good to know that when you are discouraged, there is somebody who is watching over you? Well, the song I'm going to sing is a song that is supposed to help you reflect in all the things that you're going through. Remember there's somebody. God is always watching over you. Be blessed. Discouraged 
that God doesn't only watch over me, but he also watches over you. So we can all say we sing because we are happy. Are you ready? Father, we thank you once again that you can speak to us in the, still, in the stillness of your voice. May we hear your word speak to our hearts and may we be transformed from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The journey had been long. The children of Israel had suffered. They suffered under the yoke of oppression. They suffered under Egyptian or uh, Egyptian captivity. They were hard hit. They were bent low. Their backs were aching. Their strength was dwindling. They felt they could not go any further. So from day to day, as they walked, they prayed God. They looked for the day when they would be delivered from the oppression and the yoke of Egyptian slavery. Their oppressors were hard and cruel and brutal. They did not care about the dehumanization that they were imposing on the children of Israel, the children of God, the children that had been called out to announce the gloriousness of the Lord whom we serve. And so, Moses having gone through the universities in Egypt, having been educated and probably had some PhDs, I do not know how many, probably two or three or one, but he was schooled. He had intellect. He had learned the ways of the Egyptians, their culture, for he grew in the palace. He was in that level of aristocracy. He was among the elites of the land. In fact, he was going to be the next pharaoh. But 
but he remembered what his mother told him. You don't belong there. These people who are being oppressed, these people are your brothers. These Hebrews are your uh, uh, tribesmen. And so, as you go through the process of the palace, do not forget your Hebrew brothers. Because God has sent you to be a deliverer to these people. So, as he lived in the palace, he was in the palace physically, but in his mind, he was, the, he was with the Hebrew people. He was with the Hebrew brothers. He was with his brothers there down, working hard and oppressed. That is where he was. But he had to fight. He had to fight. One day he saw an Egyptian fighting a Hebrew. He was disturbed because he knew that that was his purpose. The purpose for which he was created was to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. And he thought he was now able to do it, having gotten the education that he had, having gone through the, the process in the palace. He thought he was ready. And so he moved down, beat the Egyptian to death, buried him under the sand, and went away. But that was not God's way. God's way is not in the intellect. God's way is not in the, in the, in the power of your strength. God's way is not in your muscles. It is not in your, in your intellect. It is not in your strength or knowledge or wisdom. God's way is different. That's the place where most of us make big mistakes because we know and we think that we have now achieved. We know and think that we are able and capable based on our knowledge, based on our strength, based on our wisdom. But our wisdom is foolishness to God. Our ways are not his ways. As far as the east is from the west, so are his ways far from us. For there is a way that seemeth good and right to a man, but the end of it leads to death. God's ways are not our ways. The steps of a righteous man is ordered by the Lord. The next day, he saw two brothers, Hebrews, fighting. It is recorded in the book of Genesis. You can go and read on your own. I don't have much time to, to go through all these verses. And he asked, why are you fighting your brother? What is wrong with you? This is your brother. Don't you know this is your brother? We are Hebrews. What is wrong with you? And uh, he told the one who was beating the other Egyptian, the, told the, 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 the one who was beating, you are doing wrong. And the man told him, oh, you want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? No, no way. No way. <laughs> and so he disappeared. Moses disappeared. He ran. And he heard that Pharaoh had heard that he had killed the Egyptian and was looking for him to go and kill him. So he ran to the backside of the Midian desert. And uh, God still had mercy on him. He still preserved him in that uh, uh, Midian desert for 40 years. He was with, in fact, he gave him a wife right there. He married. He had children. And um, for him, his dreams were shattered. His ambitions were broken on the precipice of his pride. And now he was an old man. 
Now he was bent over. Now his, his, his knees were weak. Now his strength was gone. Maybe his mental capacities were now fading. Now he was facing his death. But then, at the hour of your brokenness, at the hour of your humility, when you have gone to the deep depths of despair, when you think God is over and through with you, when you have no help to come to your aid, that is when God is ready to use you and to use me. When your pride and prejudice is gone, when your high thoughts about yourself, when your pride has gone low, God tells you, now you are ready. I can use you. So I was, as he was taking care of the flocks, he saw the burning bush. The burning bush was not consumed. Even though God is a consuming fire. I, that, that's an, an irony, an oxymoron, a paradox. God is a consuming fire, but this, this bush was not being consumed. And Moses said, what, what's happening here? What's happening? What's happening? This thing is not burning. Now I'm seeing fire. So when he turned to look at the bush, he had a voice. Moses, Moses, Moses. I've heard the cry of my people. And in fact, where you are standing is holy ground. You know the story? Finally, Moses accepted, went to Egypt to go and let my people go. I share with you this story. Because of the scripture reading that we had. It is a powerful illustration of how God can fight our battles on our behalf. In fact, the book of Ephesians is one of those four books that are called the prison epistles. There's, Bible scholars believe that Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philippians, and Philemon were written from a prison cell. They are divided as to whether it was written in Rome or in some other prison. But as you read these books, you find some strength and joy exuding from the man Paul. Despite the chains that he had and the suffering that he was going through and the humiliation that was his, you find Paul's letters from the prison full of joy. For example, in Philippians, you find rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. That was written from a prison cell. Philippians 4, 6, 7, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is of good report, if there is any, anything excellent, fill your mind with these things. That's Paul in prison. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, make your request known to God. Writing from 
the prison cell. They are, they are the Red Sea now of Moses. He has managed to convince Pharaoh. In fact, God has convinced Pharaoh through some terrible acts. And these Israelites are gone. They are approaching the Red Sea. And the Egyptians are following again. It is like they made a mistake. These people shouldn't have gone. We shouldn't have left them. And so they come to the Red Sea. Well, when I was in primary school, I was reading geography and in high school. I looked at that part of the, uh, the, the map of Africa, towards the, past the Horn of Africa up there, and I see Red Sea. In the map, it looks very small, very, very small. So when I read the book and saw that the Israelites were to cross the Red Sea, I didn't think it was a, a very big issue. It didn't seem so, so massive as I was privileged to, to see it in 2006. As I stood there at the Red Sea Resort, as I was told, this is the place where the Egyptians, I mean the Israelites, crossed the Red Sea. I looked at the sea. I could hardly see beyond the horizon. I could see just a vast stretch of water. I saw big ships anchored at the shore of this sea. I was amazed when I first saw the Red Sea. And I said to myself, is this what the Bible tells me? Moses parted the Red Sea and the Israelites crossed over on dry land. I looked around for a stick that was, I could find. I don't know whether it was a reed. I took it in my hands. And symbolically, I lifted my hands up, just like Moses did when God told him, what do you have in your hands? I told God, this is what I have in my hands. I beat it on the Red Sea, but the sea did not, did not part. But I told myself, I have done this by faith in the Son of God. God, you have allowed me to come and see the Red Sea for myself. I have lifted my hands and parted like Moses. I am telling, I am telling myself today by faith that all the Red Seas of my life, as I will be flying out of Egypt to go back to Kenya, all the Red Seas of my life have been parted and no sea shall be able to block me from the destiny that God has given me. I can testify you, to you today that God has fought for me my battles. I thought I was doing it symbolically, but God took me seriously. In fact, I also took myself seriously. But I thought God would not probably just consider that. That was the launch of a wonderful experience with God. The miracles, the answered prayers, the, the things that he has done on my behalf. After I symbolically did the Red Sea thing. The, mo the most interesting thing about this, thing, this issue is that the Israelites are the army of, 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 of this pharaoh and his chariots and horsemen and his great men and all these artilleries, they are there and they are almost getting these people. And Moses tells them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. For the Lord himself will fight for you. And the Egyptians that you are seeing this day, you will never see them again forever and ever. Now, that is faith. Faith is the substance of things not seen. The, 
I mean the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He proclaims the victory before the battle is even started. That is faith. It reminds me of, jo uh, of, of, of David. When he faced Goliath, he didn't wait to, to, to swing his, uh, his stones to, to go and, 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 and knock his, his, his head off. He declared before the battle that today, you are an uncircumcised Philistine. You are coming to me with a sword and with a javelin. This day, not tomorrow. This day, not next week. This day, not next year. This day, I am going to give your head to the birds of the air. He is pronouncing victory before the battle. I know you are fighting many wars. We are fighting wars in your career. We are fighting, you are fighting for your families and your children. You are fighting depression. You are fighting oppression. In whichever form it is, you are fighting guilt. The guilt of your past. You are fighting. You, you are fighting even relationships. You are fighting even we are siblings. We are in a fight. People are fighting. Sometimes you see no result. And so, the Red Sea got parted, and the Israelites went. When the chariots of of, the, of, of Pharaoh came, they all were killed. And the Israelites, the Israelites were free to go over to possess the land which had been promised to Abraham, their forefathers. Time will not allow me to tell you about Jericho. They didn't have to fight in Jericho. They just walked. They were told, just walk around. Just walk around the city. First time, don't even talk. Then go and sit. Then the next day, just go around. Just walk. Just walk. Then go and sit. But on the seventh day, you give a shout. And the walls came tumbling down. Moses did not fight for the Israelites. It was not David who was fighting Goliath. It was not Joshua bringing down, and his people bringing down the walls of Jericho. It was God doing his thing. Sounds familiar. Because Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. But it's not I who lives. It is Christ living in me. So, this is a parallel to what Paul is saying. It is not really me who is fighting. When I win a battle in one place, glory be to God. If I win a battle over sickness, glory be to God. If I win a battle of a success in my career, glory be to God. It is not me who is fighting. It is not me who is succeeding in doing these things. It is God living in me, fighting for me the battles of life. That is why Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, the wiles of the devil. The reason you can tell you are not to fight in your strength is because after putting the whole armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, 
the gospel shoes, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth. After putting all these ready to go for battle, the Bible tells you, stand. Then why did I put all this? Why did I have to put the helmet, the helmet of, sal uh, of salvation? Why did I have to put the breastplate of righteousness? If I'm just going to, to stand, you have to stand because the Lord is the one fighting our battles. Therefore, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having guarded your waist with the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. For the word of God is like a two-edged sword, piercing through the flesh and through the bones and through the marrows into the dividing of the soul and the spirit. The word of God is powerful, able to resurrect even people from the dead. The word of God is so powerful. It changes lives. It moves people, people from prison to the pulpit. The word of God is so powerful. It revolutionizes your whole system of living. It gives you courage when you are discouraged. It gives you light at the, end, at, the, at the end of the tunnel. It gives you hope when you are hopeless and helpless. The word of God will lift you up out of your deep dungeon of, 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 of sin and place you on the solid rock, Jesus Christ. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is powerful. It, res is, it rescues us in every situation of life. It gives us direction in every place and in every situation and in every circumstance and in every experience. That is why we need the word of God. We need the faith that can move mountains. We need the breastplate of righteousness that can protect us from the wiles of the evil one. So, my fellow believers, my fellow travelers, God has called us to fight. To fight the good fight of faith. When Paul was coming to the end of his ministry, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. Henceforth now, are being poured as a, a spring, uh, 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 an offering. My life is about to be taken, but I've fought a good, a good fight. And henceforth, the Lord has prepared for me the crown of righteousness. Not to me only, but to all those who love the appearing of our God. So all of us, we can fight by putting on the whole armor of God and just stand and see the Lord fight on your behalf. What are you struggling with today? As I conclude, what are you fighting in your life? Is it sickness? Is it loss of a loved one? Is it a GPA that is below the sea level? 
Is it administrative responsibilities that probably seem to over, overwhelm you? Is it financial issues that is stopping you from registering every quarter? I want to assure you, don't worry about it. Just put on the whole armor of God and stand. I want to stand. I want to stand. As I go through the journey of life. I want to stand when it is dark and dreary. I want to stand when I'm low in the valley. I want to stand when there's no light at the end of the tunnel. I want to stand. I understand. I want to stand. How many want to stand? Stand with me if you understand. Let us pray. Father in heaven, what a wonderful time we have had in your presence. Thank you for your word that has come to us. We pray that we may stand. May we put on your whole armor that you have offered. So that, Lord, today, tomorrow, and all the days of our lives, you may withhold us like you have promised. Your children stand this afternoon. You know how each and every one of us is struggling. May you carry us in your arms so that, Lord, we may be able to stand. May you forgive us and cleanse us, and we pray that from now on, Lord, we'll have faith and hope in you that you're able to separate all our Red Seas, to break down all the struggles and trials that we go through. Father in heaven, may you increase our faith today. So that as we leave this place, it will be clear that we have been in your presence, and your word has encouraged us and moved us. Now may you be with us as we leave. May your blessing be upon us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.